dietitians in hematology uh, this is a brand new series which is based on the question and answers uh, we always heard the speakers and the specialist and the subject experts into their various fields today we have some questions we have created some curated some questions for them and as the new therapies are challenging our shows it will be great enough to learn from the the masters of this field in myeloma that how to navigate the new challenges it is also a time to introduce that fortis institute of blood disorder has developed a state of the art team with the first time being focused on single disease specialty with dr nikhil spear heading our lymphoma and myeloma uh, specialty along with dr chitresh doing aml and alls acute leukemias and dr anusha looking at the myeloproliferative neoplasm the aplastics the hlh and so and so forth we have also have an addition of infectious disease specialist which is uh, uh, helping us in developing the registries for car t cells and bite therapies along with a geneticist who is from md pediatrics and dm aims uh, in gen- genetics helping us to sort out the problems in hematology along with a geriatric uh, geriatrician was done is md from aims again finding out the mgus in these vulnerable population so over to dr nikhil and it's a great pleasure that dr shaji kumar has graciously accepted our invitation on a very short notice but next 30 minutes will be pleasurable for all of you how he navigates his therapy areas to prolong the life and ultimately as vincent says about operational cure in next uh, operational cure means people living for 10 year plus in all cytogenetic abnormalities so over to dr nikhil who has done a remarkable job in streamlining our myeloma uh, therapy areas spearheading our teclistamib and telkitamib trials along with the first car t cell from origin so over to dr nikhil thank you dr bhargav and it's a wonderful opportunity and i would really thank dr shaji for accepting our invitation at such short notice and allowing to chair this session so today's session would be on sequencing therapies in triple class refractory myeloma these patients pose a clinical challenge in our day to day practice and very often we are faced with these patients who have exhausted most of the first line therapies undergone an autologous transplant and also gotten treatments like daratumumab so choosing a treatment for these patients is a challenge in our day to day clinical practice and today dr shaji would enlighten us about sequencing bite and car t cell therapy in triple class refractory myeloma patients dr shaji kumar needs no introduction he is well known to all of us and a pioneer in the field of hematology and myeloma in specific he is a professor of medicine at mayo clinic college of medicine consultant division of hematology and medical director at the cancer clinical research office at the mayo clinic rochester usa he heads the myeloma amyloidosis and disc proteinemia group at the mayo clinic and serves as a medical director for the mayo clinic cancer center research office and associate chair for research in the department of medicine his clinical research focuses on outcome of patients with myeloma and amyloidosis and development of novel drugs for the treatment of myeloma dr shaji kumar has led numerous landmark trials in the field of multiple myeloma and is on the editorial advisory board of many reputed journals before we go ahead with today's session i would just like to inform our listeners that our upcoming webinar in the month of may would also be on a very pertinent clinical question regarding the optimal use of azacitid in venetoclax in aml patients in the indian scenario dr jayastu senapati who is a associate professor in the department of leukemia md anderson cancer center would be giving this talk on the 17th of may so to start with today's session over to you dr shaji he would be giving us the talk on sequencing bite and car t cell therapy in triple class refractory myeloma patients dr shaji you can share your screen thank you thanks nico for the introduction and thank you rahul for the opportunity it's really refreshing to see all these new therapies becoming accessible um in the indian scenario and let me see is that 
visible yes your slide is visible all right so I'll, you know this is an area that is um you know obviously rapidly changing because these immunotherapies haven't been around for long and we are still trying to better understand where do we use it specifically and how do we use it and how do we sequence it in particular so i think one of the major advances that have happened in myeloma in the past few years uh, or in the during the past decade has been the introduction of a variety of different immunotherapies and we are all very familiar with the anti cd38 monoclonal antibody that has really changed the face of myeloma therapy the antibody drug conjugates are still um, in development um, and um, obviously we'll be seeing more of that but today's um, presentation is going to be mostly focused on two specific types of immunotherapy one the bispecific antibodies three of which are currently approved in the united states for um, clinical use and chimeric antigen receptor t cell therapy or car t cells two of which are approved currently which includes the idacel and the sildacel now we had to really think about any therapy that we use in myeloma has to be thought about in the context of uh, where do we use them now obviously there are a lot of preventive strategies which are currently evolving which might use one or more of these immunotherapies we are starting to see clinical trials that are utilizing many of these immunotherapies particularly the CAR T and by specific in the newly diagnosed setting the anti cd38 monoclonal antibody is firmly um, now become a part of that initial therapy of newly diagnosed myeloma whether you are transplant eligible or not now the early relapse um, unfortunately most patients with newly diagnosed disease despite these effective therapies would relapse and the early relapse uh, therapy is primarily uh, focused on uh, using triplet regimens including those containing uh, immunomodulatory drugs proteasome inhibitors as well as monoclonal antibodies where it becomes really challenging um, have been the um, the late um, relapses were clearly um the the effective so many of the effective therapies including the the drug classes we just talked about are no longer effective against the disease and that's where we have seen these new immunotherapeutic approaches really make a difference for patients with multiple myeloma so when you um think about that patient those patients who have who are already into their fourth relapse most of those patients have seen the immunomodulatory drugs the proteasome inhibitors and anti cd38 monoclonal antibodies and are refractory to these three classes of drugs and these are the patients we often refer to as the triple class refractory patients now obviously the underlying baseline side of genetic abnormalities play an important role or determine how fast a patient becomes triple class refractory with those with high risk of genetics getting to be triple class refractory much sooner but even more relevant is the fact that once you get to be triple class refractory your outcomes are relatively poor and especially if you don't respond to the subsequent therapy then you're talking about median survival uh, less than a year so that's where the new um, therapies have uh, entered the scene um, and obviously the very first one to be approved uh, was the um, car t cell the i captigene a big lucifer idacel and again just to refresh the, uh, everyone's memory the car t cells are all designed in a way that the t cell receptor has been modified uh, in order to recognize a specific antigen which is bcma in case of idacel and sildacel now bcma or b cell maturation antigen is something that is fairly unique to the mature b cells and the plasma cells with very little expression elsewhere so forms a ideal target Uh, for treatment uh, for for myeloma they all have an intracellular costimulatory domain and a t cell activation domain and the t cell receptor structure continues to evolve rapidly with a variety of different modifications and enhancements which will make the which car t cells more effective in the future now with idacel there was the very first study that um, was the karma study that looked at the uh, idacel in patients with uh, advanced uh, relapsed refractory disease and demonstrated that at the recommended dose of 450 million cells we get an overall response rate of almost 80% and more importantly a significant proportion of these patients were mrd negative something that we previously would not have seen with most of the therapies in this late stage of the disease of course it does come with some cytotoxicities with some um, toxicities that we'll talk about in a little bit 
But primarily, um, what we are always thinking about with this CAR T cell therapy are the cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicity. Now, similarly, we had the CARTITUDE 1 trial showing that Siltacel, which again is a very similar BCMA targeting, by specific, uh, targeting CAR T cell, but uh, with two binding domains instead of one binding domain. And you can see that the response rate is close to 100% of these patients actually respond to therapy and including almost a 95% of the patients in a very good partial response or better. So very high degree of efficacy. And when you look at the durability of the response, you can see that the median PFS um, for the overall patient population is um, maybe closer to three years plus. Um, and if you get a good response um, or you get into a complete response, then um, your median PFS is exceeding uh, three years. And the median overall survival um, is far exceeds uh, what we would have expected in this particular patient group uh, if they had not received this particular therapy. Now, obviously, there are a lot of new CAR T cells that are currently going through development. So I won't go into the details of all these, but clearly many of them are targeting BCMA. And that is, again, a validated target. Some of them are looking at uh, different um, approaches for manufacturing that can be much quicker. Um, and uh, that will allow us to get these treatments to the patients sooner. But we also have CAR T cells that are being developed against alternate targets, for example, the GPRC5D. And you can see that there's uh, many of them that are going through clinical trials right now. And there is also the concept of dual targeting we'll come to in a little bit. Uh, again, with the hypothesis that if you have, um, uh, if you target two different antigens, then you are able to get a, uh, a more lasting uh, response in these patients. Now, the other class of um, T-cell-directed therapy is the bi are the bispecific T-cell engagers. It's a pretty simplistic approach. It's basically a monoclonal antibody, but with two different specificities. Um, the One of the binding domains recognizes CD3 on the T-cell, and the other recognizes a tumor antigen of interest on in the tumor cell, um, BCMA being the most common in the myeloma setting. And you can see that it essentially brings the T cells and the immune cell and the target cell close to each other, resulting in the formation of a cytolytic synapse and uh, tumor cell death. Now, we have several uh, bispecific antibodies that are going through trials and some approved. Teclistamib was the very first one to be approved. And as you can see here in a patient population that is relatively similar to what uh, was included in the CAR T trials, a overall response rate is about 60%. And the median PFS was about a year. So very similar when you think about the IDOSL data in terms of median PFS, um, even though the responses are maybe a little less um, um, in terms of in, in the, the bispecific antibodies. But again, you have to also keep in mind that bispecific antibodies are given continuously compared to the CAR T cells where it's given once and um, then you know, for the therapy. Now, elranitamab is another BCMA targeted by specific antibody. Again, you can see that the overall response rate is about 60%, very similar to teclistamab. There are some differences between the two, um, especially in terms of the frequency of administration and, and so forth. And then the when you get a good response, you can see that the median progression-free survival or the durability of response is pretty good. Of course, you don't get that um, when you're talking about patients who, um, you know, don't get a good uh, response. So the overall progression, median progression-free survival here is maybe closer to like the 15, 16 months. Um, but again, um, you know, we will continue to get more um, data from the ongoing clinical trials. Now, talcotamab was the first bispecific antibody that was approved in patients um, that, that um, used a different target. Uh, in this case, it's the GPRC5D. Um, and again, when you look at the results of the initial trial, looking at uh, talcotamab, you can see that um, they made the overall response rate, um, especially when you look at the uh, 800 milligram every two weeks, it's about 60%. Um, or uh, if you look at the slightly higher doses, then you can see that maybe a slightly higher response rate as well. So what about uh, bispecifics? Just as we saw with the CAR T cells, we have a variety of different bispecifics and now even trispecifics that are going through clinical trials. Obviously, the goal, many of them are targeted towards BCMA, but there are others that are looking at alternate targets, including the GPRC5D like the talcotamab and also FCRH5, which is the target of sevostimab that is going through clinical trials as well. 
So the questions that come up, especially with respect to the practical utilization of these therapies, um, and again, we don't have answers to all these questions, but hopefully as the data comes in over the next few years, we'll get a better sense of how uh, we can answer these questions, which has significant implications on how we're going to use it in the clinic. So um, question, you know, where should we use the therapy? Should we be using in relapse? Should we be using in newly diagnosed patients? Uh, which one should be used first, CAR T or bispecifics? And if you're going to use two of these therapies, um, should they have different targets? Should there be a different gap between the two sequential therapies? Can we combine them either uh, concurrently or, sequ or sequentially? And what does the toxicity profile uh, tell you in terms of what sequencing you may want to use in a given patient in front of you? So one of the biggest questions is when should we actually do the CAR T cell therapy in order to, or T cell directed therapy in order to obtain the maximum benefit? Now, obviously, we all know that patients go through multiple different therapies. Uh, their T cell function functionality continue to decline. And this is some preclinical work that have been done showing that in patients who have previously been exposed to um, these uh, T cell directed therapies, um, their uh, lymphos lymphocytes are probably, or T cells are less functional using a variety of different uh, assays that have been uh, used. So the question is, yes, so the, clearly there's some advantage in trying to use these therapies early on in the course of the disease before they have seen a lot of different therapies uh, and the T cell function has diminished. So the KARMA-3 trial looked at, um, is a randomized phase 3 trial um, comparing IDOSL versus standard of care therapies in patients who have had two to four prior lines of therapy and demonstrated that there was a significant improvement in the PFS and lead, recently led to the change in the label um, by the FDA to include patients with two to four prior lines of therapy and who have been exposed to all three classes of drugs. Similarly, the CARTITUDE 4 trial looked at cell to cell versus standard of care therapy in patients who have received one to three prior lines of therapy who are lenalidomide refractory. And again, um, the trial showed that there was a significant improvement in the PFS uh, with the cell to cell um, compared to standard of care therapy. So clearly using the siltasol in the early lines of therapy is practical and seem to be better than some of the contemporary regimens that we use, but still leave some questions unanswered. One is, of course, with uh, many of these therapies, the control arm did not include the most effective triplets we have, like the anti-CD38 uh, Carfilzomib combinations, Darak ARD, uh, sorry, Darak AD or the Istaximab KD. The second thing is on the right hand side, you can see the outcomes in patients with the CARTITUDE 1 who had more or three prior lines of therapy and CARTITUDE 4 with one to three prior lines of therapy. You can see that the progression free survival is quite comparable, suggesting that, you know, raising the question, is there a lot of benefit in using the CAR T cell much ahead in time? Unclear. But again, you know, it's uh, you also have to keep in mind the fact that the siltacil was a one-time therapy here, whereas if you had used the standard of care therapy, um, they, that would have continued for a long period of time. So what happens when you are um, using this uh, CAR T cells after um, uh, other BCMA-targeted therapy? And this is some of the real-world evidence showing that if you have prior B um, BCMA-targeted therapy, then Clearly, your progression-free survival is inferior to the people who have never seen BCMA-targeted therapy. Of course, there's you know these are observational um, studies, and clearly there could be bias in terms of what kind of patients are being looked at, you know, who have previously not received BCMA therapy versus who have. And when you look at the overall survival, maybe there is some suggestion that if you um, received BCMA, again the same thing that if you have not received BCMA therapy, then your outcomes are better. What about using siltacil after prior BCMA targeted therapy? You see the same thing when you can see that the um, you do get responses. You do get some uh, durability of response. The median duration of response was only eleven months, which is you know which is almost a third of what we would have uh, seen uh, in in the in the CARTITUDE one trial, suggesting that um, prior exposure, whether it be antibody drug conjugate or by specific antibodies, your response to the Siltasol do go down. But what happens when you use therapies after the patients relapse from CAR T, right? So if you look at the different groups here, you can see that um, patients who um, relapse after prior CAR T cell therapy, and if you salvage them with a bispecific antibody or another CAR T cell, you still seem to get a decent responses and decent durability of response. Um, so 
so clearly you know it doesn't using one um, t cell directed therapy after another one still is associated with good response and good durability of response but less than what you would have anticipated if they had never seen a t cell directed therapy so if you, what about the other way around what if you are looking at the by specific antibodies and what are the responses if they have previously seen um by uh, car t cell therapy or adc and here's the tetrastimab data you can see that in the patients with prior car t the overall response rate is about 57% it's a little less than or fairly comparable to you know again different patient populations and if you had seen a prior adc it's about 50% now again here you can see that um in patients who have um received a idosal therapy before Uh, you can see that the tetrastimab activity is substantially reduced it's about 30% and the pfs is also significantly lower in patients who have previously uh, seen idosal before getting the tetrastimab what about elrenatumab again you can see here that people um, who have had prior um, uh, anti bcm therapy the response rate is about 46% and keep in mind this was about 63% in, on the overall patient population in the elren uh, study so how do we get around this you now can we use a different target can we use multiple targets in order to overcome the problem you now we can look at the data from the uh, gprc 5d targeting car t cell therapy um, and you can see that patients um, with a prior bcma targeted um, therapy you do see a reduction in the response rate uh, from the 96 in those who did not to about 76 in those did so even if when you're using a different target you still are losing some efficacy and that may be a reflection of the t cell function um, in these patients in the monumental one trial if you look at the patients who had previously uh, seen a prior t cell re- uh, redirection therapy you can see that um, the the overall response rate do go down particularly in that subgroup here previously seen by specific antibodies and if you look at it again uh, across the cohorts you can see that the median dur- duration of response and the median pfs is also significantly lower uh, in patients who have previously seen t cell redirection therapy 5.1 months versus about 14 months in those um, others the other option is to use combinations right so we can use the uh, talcotumab in combination with daratumumab we can use teclizumab in combination with daratumumab and in the trim2 trial we can clearly see that the um even in patients who have previously been exposed to um t cell redirection therapy you can still get good responses by using these combination approaches and another approach is to use two different antigens um to be targeted at the same time so this is the gco12f from the gressel therapeutics that uh, has been studied even in newly diagnosed disease but overall it clearly seems that um the dual targeted uh, car t cells very effective high overall response rate very good duration of response um and very fast onset of response as well now we don't know how they compare head to head with the uh, bcma alone targeted car t cell those kind of trials have not been done yet but it's certainly a intriguing hypothesis that will have to be explored as we go ahead now um the another aspect that is um you know under exploration is the use of allogeneic car t cells advantage of allogeneic car t cells obviously is off the shelf um you can you know give it to the patients right away however certainly have some disadvantages in the sense you know these of these patients need more profound immunosuppression it does definitely need some um, more tweaking of these t cells uh, in order to avoid the um, any kind of graft versus uh, host disease so there are clearly a uh, lot of there's a pros and uh, cons for autologous versus allogeneic car t cells won't go into a lot of the details but again i think the advantage is the earlier use of therapy however the, the data with the allogeneic car t cells so far has not really um, shown any advantage over uh, the autologous car t cells so obviously i think there's still much that needs to be learned now obviously the management uh, the toxicity management um across both the by specifics and the um car t cells um uh, has some again some common things the cytokine release syndrome is common across both groups even though the cytokine release syndrome tend to be um of a less severe grade in the car t in the by specific antibody population the neurological toxicity is again less uh, severe and less frequent in the by specifics compared to the car t cells 
Um, you can rarely skip patients with uh, HLH or the macrophage activation syndrome. They can sometimes be fatal, so it's hard to can sometimes be hard to treat. There are some long-term toxicities that we see in these patients, including prolonged cytopenias um, and T-cell suppression, maybe related to the use of fludarabine, B-cell apresia leading to hypogamma globulinemia, and also significantly elevated risk of infections in some of these patients. So um, there are a lot of different adverse events, and if you look across these different trials, looking at a variety of different bispecific antibodies and uh, CAR T-cells, uh, you do see... Um, that there is a significant um, uh, cytopenia that you can see, increased risk of infections, certain toxicities like dysgeusia is uniquely seen in patients uh, getting uh, GPRC5D targeted therapy, same for uh, the skin rash and uh, nail related events. But the cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicity are the more common toxicities. Um, and I think we are continuing to learn how best to um, take care of patients um, uh, with these uh, toxicities. Um, and then, you know, in terms of, you know, what you might use first can to some extent may also depend on what the patient is uh, able to tolerate. So if you have disease that is uh, rapidly progressing, then CAR T cell may not uh, be the appropriate thing. A bispecific antibody may be the first thing that you may want to use. Uh, if it is a more old, more frail patients, maybe uh, there's advantage to using the bispecifics first. Um, and again, if they have good organ function, they're able to get good through the CAR T-cell therapy. And our preference is to use the CAR T-cell before the uh, bispecific antibody. And sometimes, you know, the logistics, um, patient preference, and all these things would also play an important role in deciding which path you particularly take in a given patient. So I think both the, you know, just, just to conclude, both these, um, both these cell-directed therapies, um, whether CAR-T and bispecific, they are both effective treatments. Um, and, you know, there is no um, uh, convincing evidence that um, using them in the newly diagnosed setting um, would be have an advantage of using it in the later lines so far. But I think those are the clinical trials that are ongoing right now. The response rates will continue to drop once you use one T cell redirection therapy after the other. How do we get over this limitation? Can we possibly by using a different antigen targeted um, or using dual antigen targeting or use giving some adequate gap between these different therapies um, or using different approaches to enhance the function and the uh, durability of the uh, T cells? Um, so I think these are all different approaches that are being explored in order to maximize the benefit of the T-cell reduction therapy. And of course, at the end of the day, reimbursement ability to tolerate and logistics will also play an important role. So with that, I'll stop and uh, be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Shaji, for that excellent lecture. You covered all the recent advances and all the possible treatment options in the pipeline for this difficult set of patients. It was wonderful listening to you and our audience from 10 different countries and over 200 doctors all across the globe are listening to you at this point. Uh, I would like to go on with the question and answer session. We have collated few questions that have received from our Indian colleagues. Uh, so can we go ahead? Uh, Dr. Shaji, are you uh, able to hear me? Yep, I can hear you fine. Yes, go ahead. Uh, so, uh, is there any specified duration of exposure to each class of drug before we label them refractory? So, in general, for the clinical trial purposes, refractoriness is defined as um, progression on treatment or within 60 days of discontinuing a particular therapy. And the refractoriness is often defined in terms of what particular agent that the patient is uh, refractory to. Now, it's kind of a little harder uh, with uh, in the context of CAR T cells. How do we define them as refractory? Because obviously, that's not a continuous therapy. Um, so eventually, as we get more experience, we'll probably define them on the basis of how long the response lasted in the absence of a maintenance therapy but to, uh, to say if they are relatively refractory to a CAR T cell approach. Uh, and uh, the next question is, are there any baseline predictors for like high risk cytogenetics or mutations that can predict a refractory disease, a possibility of the patient becoming refractory to initial line of treatment. 
right? So eventually all patients will become refractory to all the therapies we apply, but uh, there are certain characteristics at baseline that uh, predicts that someone is going to become refractory to multiple drugs in the shorter uh, in a short time frame, and that's predominantly high risk cytogenetics. So in the era of quadruplet therapy, it's unusual to see uh, primary refractoriness to the initial line of therapy, but that still happens. So those patients have often very poor prognosis. The next comes the patients we often refer to as functional high risk, and these are patients who relapse within the first 18 months or so, and they also tend to have poor outcome. And then the rest of the patients will eventually become triple class refractory uh, over, over a period of time. Our next question is related to uh, that. If patients have received daratumumab and they have been dara and exposed for a significantly prolonged period like six months to one year, can they still be re-exposed to DARA considering that they had an initial response when they turned absolutely. refractory to other treatments? Yeah, absolutely. And I would frame it in the uh, frame the answer in the context of general and ICD-38 monoclonal antibody because we have two of them, Daratumumab and Isataximab, both right. of which appear to be equally effective. So you know, it's not just something unique for um, the anti-CD38. I think all myeloma drugs, we know we can reuse them as long as the patient has not seen it for a period of time. There is no defined period per se. Uh, it all depends. The longer the gap between the first and the uh, subsequent use, the more um, benefit you're going to see with that drug. But invariably, um, the, when you use that drug the second time, the, the depth and the durability of response is going to be less than what we obtained in the very first time. And when a patient becomes triple class refractory, should an NGS be done? Is there any role of NGS in a triple class refractory patients before deciding on further treatment? So if you're using, if you're thinking about in the context of, you know, using a CAR T-cell therapy or bispecific antibody, there's really not much from the NGS data that is going to inform you um, of whether to use, whether to use a CAR T or bispecific or what to use. There is some data showing that um, mutations in the BCMA antigen um, can increase the resistance or even the loss of BCMA uh, can uh, lead to uh, resistance to the CAR T and bispecific antibodies. But I don't think we are at a point where we can use the data to decide on whether to use them or not. What where it can be useful is, especially maybe in the current setting, once they're even refracted to the T cell redirection therapy, you see that you know a major clone has a mutation that you can target, for example, a RAS mutation, we know that we see that in almost half of these patients, then treatment with a MEK inhibitor might be helpful. But often, in, even in that case, a single agent MEK inhibitor is unlikely to give you durable deep responses. So you may want to think about using that in the context of, of in combination with other therapies. If a patient progresses on BCMA CAR T, can they be offered a different GPRC 5D CAR T cell therapy? Uh, absolutely. If um, patient progresses on one CAR T cell therapy, later on, can they be offered a different CAR T cell focusing a different focusing on a different yeah, target? I think it certainly you can offer them, and we know from the data that it certainly can be effective as well. However, you know, most of the time, uh, the it's finan from a finance standpoint and insurance standpoint, it is not something that is often uh, or that's something easily available. And going forward with CAR T cell coming in earlier in the lines of treatment of myeloma, do you see CAR T cell therapy at one point becoming potentially curative for myeloma patients if they are used early in treatment? You know, it's, it's hypothetically, yes. Uh, you know, there may be patients where you can get deep enough response that they are potentially cured uh, with that initial well, first line therapy. We do see a fraction of patients getting cured even with the current therapies probably is about 15%, but that's a number that's likely to keep going up with the new treatments. Great. I think you already answered this in your talk, but what are the different bite therapies available and how do they compare with each other in terms of efficacy? So again, you know, I think we have to be careful of what, how we term it. Bite is something, it's, it's a proprietary name that is owned by Amgen. So bispecific antibody is probably a better way to refer to them because it's... Um, now that encompasses all the different um, therapies we have. Yes, I think um, what we have seen is across all the bispecific antibodies, we certainly see um, 
um, a relatively similar response rate of about 60 to 65 percent irrespective of the antigen being targeted um, so i think um, it's really nothing much to choose between the different bispecific antibodies it, it, the, the exception of maybe the toxicity profile Obviously, if you target the GPRC5D, you do see skin and nail toxicity and altered taste, which can be quite cumbersome. Um, we, um, uh, if <clears throat> with some of the agents, um, there have been maybe a little more of cytokine release syndrome versus the others. Some are given weekly, where others are given three to four every three to four weeks. So convenience could be a um, factor in terms of deciding which one to use. And uh, this question, I think, holds a lot of relevance in the Indian context. Both bites, by specific as well as CAR T cell therapy are still not freely available in our country. So for triple class refractory myeloma patients, in the absence of these two, what are the other potential options that can be explored in an Indian setting? Yeah, I think it's an important question. I think we have to think about, you know, we have to be, take a very careful look at what they have received, how long ago did they receive it, and were they truly refractory? So if somebody is not truly refractory to a therapy, you can always reuse it. If they have not seen it for a long time, you have can still reuse it. And if they cannot use any of the three major classes, then the others that are available, like Selenex or it's a small uh, molecule drug that has been approved, uh, typically used in combination with the anti-CD38 or a proteasome inhibitor. Patients with 11-14 translocation, we have seen really good activity with venetoclax, often again used in combinations. And then there are all the therapies, you know, that has previously has been shown to be effective, right? So if especially if it's an older patient who is unlikely that you're going to be thinking about an autotransplant or collecting cells for a CAR T, then uh, melphalan-based therapy is very reasonable. But use of um, hydrosalkylators, alkylators, whether it be melphalan or whether it be uh, bendamustine, uh, you really have to be careful if it's someone whom you think can go to CAR T later on, you should not use those. Otherwise, certainly those would be reasonable too. Uh, one more question in the chat box. Does anti-BCMA therapy hold the risk of antigen escape and subsequent relapse? Certainly. You know, there are different mechanisms of action that are probably in, in place. The vast majority of the patients relapsing on a BCMA anti, a bispecific antibody still retains the expression of BCMA. So it's more likely that it's the more of a T-cell function that is um, uh, that is the problem here. However, there is a proportion of patients where either the BCMA expression is still there, but the antigen is mutated, um, and the binding capacity for a given bispecific is no longer there. And those patients might respond to a different bispecific or CAR-T that is targeted towards the BCMA uh, that can still bind the mutated BCMA. And there's a few where there's biallelic deletion um, uh, that leads to um, the the lack of um, BCMA expression completely, but of course there won't be any activity either. Great. I think you covered this also in your talk, but what are the new treatment options in pipeline for these patients? Other than the CARTs and the bispecifics that we discussed about, are there any other potential agents which are in the pipeline for triple class refractory myeloma patients? Yeah, so within the same class of the CAR T and the bispecifics, um, you know, there are CAR Ts that are being um, uh, that are continuing to be you know improved. One is obviously the manufacturing time, the manufacturing methodology instead of LND viral vector, different approaches, and then most importantly, trying to see if we can make the CAR T cells mount a more robust response um, by what we call the armoring the CAR T cells or an armored CAR T cell where there might be. Um, also engineered to secrete cytokines to overall enhance the immune react reaction that happens. There are also um, approaches to try and see if we can um, um, get more of the naive T cells into the mixture so that they, the durability of the T cells hang around for a longer period of time. And with the uh, bispecific antibodies, clearly there are um, approaches to, uh, to try you know, developing tri-specific antibodies um, and also uh, using you know, different antibodies in combination and so forth. So a lot of exciting things in that immune arena that are looking at tweaking these two principles of therapy. Great. And which one is superior, CAR T cell, SILTA versus ID cell? You know, there is no trial looking at them head to head, and it's difficult to compare the data from the uh, CAR T2 trials to the Karma trials because the patient population was different in the two studies. 
you know, the median PFS of the IDA cell that has also been confirmed in real world studies in that late stage is about a year or slightly less with SILTA cell in a slightly different patient population, but still late stage was close to three years. So it's, you know, there's obviously um, the with more and more real world studies coming out, we'll get a better sense. Great. Uh, and another question is, in those patients who relapsed after CAR T cells, uh, did they restore the BCMA expression? Uh, I mean, that's yeah, not... so it, some of them, you know, again, remember that myeloma is a heterogeneous disease with various subclones. So when you look at the patient's myeloma, yes, we see the BCMA sometimes coming back. That's because the BCMA expressing clone now is growing back up. Uh, and it's pos possible that the BCMA non expressing clone decreases in size as we stop therapy and the therapy selection pressure goes away. Any role of tandem transplant in young patients compared to a single autologous transplant, especially in those patients who have not received it? Yeah, I think, you know, the European data would suggest that you can consider doing a tandem auto transplant in high risk patient population. However, you know, in our own practice where we have very effective um, injection therapy um, and a two drug maintenance, then I don't think there's really a role for tandem auto transplant in that setting. Can we do a CAR T cell as a consolidation in a young high risk patient post autologous stem cell transplant? Absolutely. I think that is being explored in clinical trials. And I think in particularly in this high risk patient population, that may be important. Again, it's, you know, the problem with the high risk is not that we don't get a deep enough response. It's the ability to keep them in response. So I think with the with our current level of knowledge, it's hard to visualize a setting where uh, you don't need some kind of maintenance in this high risk patient population. But it is obviously something that needs to be studied. Uh, should there be any maintenance treatment after a CAR T cell therapy? Is it no, right now? Be? Yeah, right now it isn't uh, typically used, but some of the upfront trials that are looking at CAR T maintenance is included post CAR T. I think again, as I said, it's probably going to be much more important for those patients with high risk disease that we use the maintenance. What is the best treatment option available for relapsed patients with multiple extramedullary disease sites? You know, this is uh, these patients are obviously high risk disease, um, and um, um, you know, many of those people, we tend to use uh, VDT-based type regimens to try and debulk some of that extramedullary disease before we move them on to a more definitive therapy, whether it be transplant or CAR T cells or other immune directed therapies, because these are the patients who don't seem to do very well with the CAR T and the bispecific antibodies nowadays. Going forward, how would you sequence treatment in a fit and eligible patient, auto transplant, bispecific, and CAR T cells? You know, right now, I think based on the phase three trials, the trans auto transplant should be the part of the initial treatment, and the others come up in the, at the time of relapse. But there are clinical trials like trying to see if we can replace the auto transplant with the uh, with these um, uh, newer therapies, particularly CAR T cells. So it to be determined. And uh, I think you already spoke about venetoclax and relapse multiple myeloma for patients with translocation 11, 14. Uh, does CAR T cell work across all cytogenetics groups? It appears that it works. It's effective in all patients in terms of inducing the response, but obviously the high risk cytogenetics patients tend to relapse faster. Any use of GCSF post CAR T cell treatment? Early on in post CAR T, does GCSF affect the proliferation of CAR T cells? They don't um, affect the proliferation because, again, the GCSF is going after the uh, myeloid lineage, especially the neutrophils. Um, and um, the we don't typically use GCSF routinely. Only if patients have persistent cytopenias do we use uh, GCSF. And for an extramedullary disease, by specific versus CAR T, which would be preferable? You know, that's a hard question in the sense the data suggests that neither of them work as well in the uh, extramedullary setting. Um, so I think it, there's a room for us to try conventional therapies to debug the disease before starting them on treatment. Um, having said that, you know, I think if the CAR T is available, I think prefer to use that over the uh, by specific for right now. With different CAR T cells hitting the market, 
how do we compare one car t cell with other in a clinical sense how do we compare the efficacy and choose which car t cell would be best for our patients yeah it's unlike we will have comparative trials between these so i think we'll have to rely on the real world evidence that is generated in terms of using one versus the other and there may be situations where the toxicity profile might um, suggest that um, um, a specific one is used instead of another one and uh, in patients with myeloma and associated amyloidosis is car t still equally efficacious yes i think there is a very limited data mostly from the israeli group where they included a bunch of patients who had amyloid and myeloma and seemed like it can be effective and we know in general therapies that we use in myeloma are effective in amyloid as well in terms of getting rid of the clone so we hope that it will also be helpful for those patient population I think we have completed all the questions in the chat box. Once again, thank you, Dr. Shaji, for patiently answering so many questions and clearing all our queries. It was wonderful <laughs> listening to you. I would thank you once again for giving such a elegant lecture in such a short span of time. You have covered the topic very well and made clinical practice a lot easier. And hopefully, this would contribute. to treatment of triple class myeloma patients better thank you so much thank you thank you shaji and look forward to see you more academic meetings and a collaboration for amyloidosis thank you shaji thanks a lot yeah take care bye 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 thank you thanks a ton uh mr nikhil you are muted uh sorry once again on behalf of fortis institute of blood disorders we thank all the participants who have attended this webinar we hope it was a useful learning experience and dr shaji's talk would help us in making our clinical practice better thank you all and we'll join in next month with the second webinar session on use of azacitidine and venetoclax in aml patients in the indian setting with a similar discussion with dr jaystu from md anderson once again thank you all and thank you mqr for a flawless uh, uh, conversation and the platform thank you thank you very much sir